Hello, and welcome to the U.S. Geological Survey Coastal Marine Geology Podcast. I'm Matthew Simonov. The Arctic Ocean is one of the most remarkable bodies of water on the planet. It houses large charismatic predators like polar bears, whales, and seals, critical species like shellfish and phytoplankton, and an array of organisms found nowhere else on Earth. The Arctic Ocean is also the most inaccessible and least explored ocean. Its remoteness has kept it ecologically pristine. But the Arctic is where climate change impacts are strongest, and where global changes are underway. The oceans currently absorb about one-fourth of man-made carbon dioxide emissions that enter the atmosphere. As CO2 dissolves in the ocean, it becomes carbonic acid, with the innate ability to lower pH levels. This phenomenon of lowering pH in the oceans, known as ocean acidification, is predicted to directly affect calcifying organisms such as corals and phytoplankton, as well as the multitudes of marine life that depend on them for food and habitat. If pH continues to drop, then profound global changes in marine food webs and ecosystems could occur. Ocean acidification information is largely non-existent for the Arctic. To determine what impact greater carbon dioxide absorption is having on the marine environment, U.S. Geological Survey scientists are gathering vital data from these remote waters. Collecting CO2 information and related chemical samples in the largely uncharted Arctic Ocean will fill in important gaps of knowledge for a greater understanding of the impacts increased CO2 is having on ocean chemistry. This unprecedented data set will help decipher trends in ocean acidification, analyze relations between ocean chemistry trends and human and natural activities, and determine implications for calcifying organisms. Understanding climate change impacts in the Arctic is of high global priority. Working with federal agencies and the international scientific community, the USGS continues to address an issue that will have broad global influence on the marine world. The Coastal Marine Geology Podcast is produced in St. Petersburg, Florida, and is a product of the U.S. Geological Survey, Department of the Interior. The surprise is how sensitive some marine organisms are to this increased acidity from carbon dioxide. And when acidity gets too high, shells dissolve. We're changing the basic rules of everything. And because of that, a lot of organisms may not be able to survive. Shelled creatures such as corals and plankton play a key role in the ocean food web. Pteropods are a kind of plankton that live all around the world and in great abundance in polar waters. Pteropods are especially vulnerable. Okay. Should I focus in that? Yeah, maybe right, right in there. Mm-hmm. We're looking at pteropod shells which are planktonic snails with a calcium carbonate shell that we collected from Antarctica this past winter. And you can see it looks like there's this lip where it may have already started to dissolve and kind of curled over, because that's what it looks like when it dissolves. It kind of melts, almost like a candle and wax melting. The shell thickness along the leading edge right here is less than one micrometer thick. These are the thinnest pteropod shells I've ever seen. There's growing alarm that higher acidity will extinguish creatures like pteropods that are a basic food source for fish. In many parts of the world, fish are a basic food source for people. So you can't just The only way to stop acidification is to emit less carbon dioxide. 
our Industrial Revolution began more than two centuries ago. Technology has advanced rapidly since then, but we still make energy as we have for hundreds of thousands of years, by setting things on fire. Often, we squander the energy we make, using more than necessary to accomplish our goals. But now we know how to use energy more efficiently, how to do more with less. There was a time when people thought about energy efficiency and conservation as sacrifice, doing without, dark homes, shuttered economies. That is emphatically not what we're talking about. We're talking about getting dramatically more work out of less energy with better technology. Those energy efficiency solutions are particularly promising because the whole world will want to adopt them. If we take that initial step, we will also, in addition to reducing carbon pollution, have the very welcome dividend uh, in the form of economic stimulus because we'll, we'll be reducing energy bills. We know how to capture energy cleanly from sunlight, wind, tides, and the heat of the Earth's core. Imagine that you're living in a house that gets some of its electricity from its own solar panels, feeds some of that back into your own vehicle when it's plugged in at night, provides you with energy services, and maybe this is the most important single piece of it, uh, at costs below those you're paying now. That double dividend was never more needed by the U.S. and world economy than it is right now. We are on the verge of a green industrial revolution, a revolution that will expand our economy, protect our resources, and give us real energy independence. There is much we don't know about how carbon pollution will affect our world. Still, we have to choose. We can go on as we have, forcing future generations to survive somehow without the vast ocean resources that have sustained us. Or we can move beyond fossil fuels, securing a future that works for all of us, for all living things. What will we choose?